Before launching our new video resource, Stay or Leave, today I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands upon which we live and work and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. This land was never ceded and colonisation has wreaked harm and havoc not only upon First Nations people and their communities, but on the reciprocal relationship that Indigenous people share with the land. For thousands of years, First Nations people have nurtured this country through cultural burning, a cultural practice constrained by colonial approaches to fire management. They have watched in anguish as human-induced climate change has altered this landscape and its seasons, as fire has ravaged their communities and precious lands. As we launch this resource, we acknowledge the deep wisdom and enduring connections of Indigenous peoples, the need for their voices and lived experience to be reflected in the way we understand and adapt to fire seasons, and we reiterate our respect for Indigenous rights to self-determination. This was and always will be Aboriginal land. So Stay or Leave was shaped by the extensive work in the gender and disaster space by our collaborative project, Gender and Disaster Australia. Gender and Disaster Australia was formally established in 2015 to promote an understanding of the role of gender in survivor responses to natural disasters and to embed these insights into emergency management practice. Since its formation, this initiative has highlighted the way disaster, like bushfires, exacerbates the social norms experienced in everyday life, with women and men feeling increased pressure to conform to outdated gender stereotypes. The pioneering research of Gender and Disaster Australia has shown increased rates of family and domestic violence before, during and after disaster, reflecting a heightening of the unequal gender roles and power dynamics seen right across Australian communities. The past two years have brought disaster to our very doorsteps during the 2019 Black Summer bushfires and more recently the COVID-19 pandemic. And as we look towards another bushfire season, we're keen to develop a resource that could encourage our communities to reflect on how they plan for, prevent and respond to disaster related family violence. We wanted it to be gripping and evocative of what happens in bushfire affected communities when the fire goes out. So I'm so delighted today to be joined by the two creators behind Stay or Leave, author Kate Kennedy and animator Annie Murray, for a quick peek behind the scenes of this powerful piece of work. So thanks Kate and Annie for joining me today. Pleasure, thanks Jade. Um, so I'd love to hear from each of you to begin with um, about your professional background, as well as a little bit about how your lives as women, feminists and community members might have brought you into contact with the ideas behind Stay or Leave. Sure. I'll turn the floor over to Kate to start with because she, um, she was the voice behind the poem and the, um, the heart and soul behind it. So oh, Kate, please take the floor. Thanks Annie. Um, well, I... Uh... I guess I lived in uh, Northeast Victoria from 2002 until about 2015. And so, um, of course, that was the beginning of the noughties, which was, you know, uh, a huge period of drought. And I was uh, living on a farm and immediately I was sort of plunged into that world of having to be ready all the time, having to be kind of poised and ready for, for the possibility of disaster. And of course, we did have we did have fires and floods in that time. There was the you know, the 2003 Alpine fires and then, of course, um, the Black Saturday fires in 2009, but also the Beechworth fires in 2009. So amongst all that sort of seeing how the community reacts um, to sort of disaster and the kind of duress and pressures of disaster and, and what emerges out of that was really interesting to me. And I had actually written uh, a book of poetry um, about that time called The Taste of River Water. Uh, and so that was basically about living on the farm. And there was some poems in there about sort of floods and droughts and just the general sort of difficulties and hardships of trying to be a good custodian of a place, you know, like how do we live on the land? It's a very fraught relationship, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, uh, a friend, Helen McGowan, suggested that I might be a good person to maybe uh, be part of this project. And so I had a look at what you were doing and thought, yeah, I think I could probably you know, um, put something together to make the kind of short animation that you were looking for. But obviously what I'm looking at, if I'm doing a piece of writing is, is what people are listening to. And what there also has to be is what they're looking at to make this a sort of a sensory experience, which was where sort of Annie's work came in. All right, and what about you, Annie? 
Okay. Um, so I, my, my background as an animator is I've always been a bit of an agitator for change and um, sort of, you know, putting my voice, my, my voice in my mouth where my money is. Um, I was approached by your um, Women's Health West, uh, Women's Health North West East Goulburn. Um, oh, nice. <laughs> there's too many words. Um, to take part in the project. And of course, once it was explained to me what it was about, like I just jumped at it. Um, and then as an added bonus, I learned that I'd be working with Kate Kennedy, which is, you know, fantastic to work with such a, a wordsmith and a well-established artist. It was just a bit of a dream come true. So um, the marrying of the, the words, the audio and the visual, some projects you, you really heavily direct and you, you tell them where they're going to go. This project d directed me entirely. Um, I was sort of at the, the, not the mercy of, but the whims of, um, you know, what, what was going to come through in the words. So it was, it was developing as we went. And so, yeah, when I, when I first read your poem, the, the thing that really struck me was the, the uncertainty of it all. Um, the uncertainty of the land and the uncertainty of the future and the uncertainty of, uh, as a, a person going home after the fire's out, what, what fire am I walking into? Mm. And, you know, how can we start talking about this as a society and how can we start getting this out as, as part of, you know, like common culture and dialogue and, and raising awareness of these things and looking after the people that need to be looked after, whoever that might be, whether it's the men or the women or the land, it's, it's all tied together. And, and nothing can exist without the other and, you know, the other can't exist without that. So, yeah, it was a very, it was an impacting piece for me to work on and just, you know, listening to it over and over again and hearing your, your voice, Kate, you know, I had, it's a very special place in my part, in my heart that, um, that, that poem and this project lives in. And I, I hope it goes on to, to make a difference. I really do. I really That's do. So nice. And it's, um, yeah. I've heard that you've, you've both sort of developed it quite a friendship um through yeah. this process and it's really nice to see your energy as you know collaborating together on such a creative mm. piece. thank um, you so you've crafted a piece of work as you were saying um that really gives us as viewers such a powerful look at the experience of bush bushfires through the eyes of a woman whose world has been rocked not just by the fire itself um but also by intimate partner violence um, in creating this piece, what was it about putting yourself in this woman's shoes that stood out most for you? How did it make you feel throughout the process? Hmm. Um, well, <laughs> that's what you're trying to aim to do all the time, I think, when you're making any kind of piece of art or writing or anything, is you're trying to give your audience or your reader or your listener this kind of illusion of access into the mind of someone who's not them, I guess, mm -hmm. to see how it feels yep. so we can actually practice our empathy to think, wow, what would I do if that was me? How would that feel? That's, and so when you, so the first thing I wanted to do was to kind of acknowledge, you know, that we, there's a kind of expression in the, in the literary world where we say, you know, crisis reveals character. And it does. It's, some, it's not when things are going well that we see what people are made of. It's when things start going wrong. And of course, usually our operating systems work and they let us kind of you know cover up or paper over some of those cracks but of course a crisis like a disaster uh reveals them and mm -hmm. we see what is going on for people internally as well as what they're presenting externally and usually oh. i think in my life experience at least there's often quite a dissonance between those two things and there's there's kind of a sense of there has to be secrecy and there's kind of dread and there's things that people would rather not be brought out into the open but of course uh, a crisis is what breaks that surface. And so I wanted to find a voice that was going to do that, um, that was an expressive voice, an ordinary voice that could be anybody. And also I wanted to make it, to give it a sort of an urgency because it is operating on those two levels. You know, there's a sense of the fire. There's a sense of this acute um, disaster that we need to put out, you know, and put and sort of put away. But there's also this other sense of, um, a, a chronic thing that's going on where our dread around what this is going to reveal mm. and what this is going to bring out. So I wanted a sense of urgency uh, and I wanted it to be like a kind of a testimony or a testament so that somebody was like whispering to you or telling you, a, a weary person was telling you what's at stake for them and what's going on for them because I felt, well, that's what people are going to be listening to and it's that sense of being able to know how it feels to be someone who perhaps is not you or has exactly your experiences, 
but we can still feel for them and and empathize with that situation to think well what what do we do in this kind of you know so that kind of world of symbols is great in language to try and use but of course what it needs is something which can accompany it uh, which is equally kind of nuanced and uh, I don't know Annie I suppose with what people are looking at um, mm. it, it's it, it, you need something that people can also project themselves into yes. maybe is not too figurative but on their own terms they can see something universalizing in those images yeah Absolutely. And I think a lot of conversation went into um, the, the visuals and how we were going to focus on abstract um, mm. and almost experimental visuals um, to present the story uh, visually to the audience, because you don't want to pigeonhole what they're looking at um, in such a way that it, it makes it hard for people to picture themselves in there if that wasn't their exact experience. So abstract just does that so beautifully by leaving the door open, presenting mm. a visual that you know, is impactful and emotive along with the audio that's going with it, um, but also leaves space enough for a whole array of audience to inject themselves into it and to feel those emotions and to say, that's what it was like for me. Like maybe, maybe that wasn't exactly what it was like, but I understand that feeling. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you build connection and, um, you know, rapport with your audience. And, and that's where you build community understanding of what has happened and, and why it's important to talk about. And, um, the, the, actually the hardest part to animate that the, the trickiest part I found was when Kate, you were talking, um, in the poem about, um, community being around you and, you know, the food drive and you're just exhausted inside and you have to still smile and you have to still say, thank you. You have to say thank you, even though it's a disaster and you're walking back into another disaster and you're, you have to put this face on and you're broken down in more ways than one. And like that just hit me so hard. That hit me so hard because I'd, I'd been in those shoes before and it's you, you're you numb, but you're feeling everything at the same time. Mm -hmm. And to try and like to try and present that visually, the only way that I could figure out to do it was to do it completely abstractly and to, to make up like images of what I thought community looked or felt like. Mm -hmm. um, and with the words over the top, without those words, you probably wouldn't know what was going on visually, but with the words on top of them, yeah. it brings it together in such a way that it's, it's a very impactful part of the story. Um, and it was, yeah, it was a real journey for me to, to be involved in, in this piece because of that. Well, it was amazing to see what you made out of that because, of course, okay. you know, there's that whole beautiful double layer thing where, as I said, there's like imagery and language that's metaphorical, you know, that's opening up those layers. But when we're looking at something, when something is in front of us and we are looking at those two things in counterpoint, our brains are doing something really specific, I think, you know, we're projecting ourselves in, but we're also feeling this, hopefully, this sense of empathy and understanding and also just acknowledgement, I think. Yeah. Acknowledgement that this is this is our human experience. This is this is yeah. this is what we're made of, you know. Men or women, um, what what happens to us under pressure and under duress? Like how do we move on and move on through it uh, with it with that kind of that's the thing also about crisis of course isn't it is that it it leaves us with not very much except insight no, <laughs> you know? um, no it doesn't yeah it does of what, not of what we can do wrong. next time and so when there's those kind of double layers happening in the in the piece where it says that you're burnt out for example you know yeah um those things kind of they they dip under that you you said before jade it's something evocative i always think that we are evoking something and it's it's what it's doing is like activating something in the viewer or the listener yes that, that resonates with them i think what i loved about it so much as well as you've touched on is that you really managed with the combination of, of the words and the imagery to capture the urgency of an immediate disaster and then that slow unfolding sort of discomfort of, of a more slow and intimate disaster as well so i just thought that was done so so beautifully um which i guess comes to my last question which is um just as creators of um prose and captivating image what was the process of working across those mediums together like for you guys it was nice <laughs> <laughs> it was so much fun and it was so it was beautiful watching it unfold 
um the the team that you know Kate and I worked with was so supportive and um communicative and it was just it was wonderful watching Kate create the poem and then to hear her voice reading it it just it came alive um and that's when I started having the ideas for the visuals and and everything and it, it really I fed off off you <laughs> I feel like I fed off you a little bit too you know that's the great thing about collaboration isn't it is yeah. that you know Annie sent the kind of the background images and the um it was wonderful to see the kind of like the color palette for example and how that was making its own narrative in the piece and then feeling just such admiration for the way then that there were these beautiful figures who couldn't I showed it to my 15 year old daughter and she said what I love about it is they could be anyone they could be me and they could be you yes was, you know yes. Beautiful. <laughs> So it's a really collaboration is a fantastic thing because you see something that's a spark of your idea, not yep. just realised, I've got to say, but made a lot better by someone else's kind of vision that comes in and it, it strengthens and builds on it. Um, so I, I love the process of collaborating with Annie and I'd love to do it again. In some I way. think we will. I, I, I think we will. <laughs> it's almost a sure thing. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Creating connections. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, it's such a beautiful, powerful piece of work and, and it's been an honour for us to be able to work with you and bring this out to our communities. So thank you so much. Well, thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yeah. You too.